so glad that you're here this morning. Would you help me and join, uh, welcome everybody who's watching us online today. Come on, let's give them an applause. We're so glad that you're with us. Thanks for tuning in. I know I've heard from several of you that said, hey, I'm going to be watching online this week, so we're glad that you are a part of the Spirit Church family. And of course, those of you who are here this morning, you look beautiful and you smell even better. So thanks for that, because I was on a plane this week behind someone who didn't smell very good, and I like to be around people who look good, who smell good, but most of all, who love Jesus. Amen, and that's what brings us together today. Real quick, before we dive into the Word, I want to talk to you about some things that you already know about with regard to Spirit Church. The purpose of Spirit Church is summed up just in a short phrase, to please God. That's why we exist as a church family, is to please God. That is the metric or the lens that we run everything we do through. Our deacons will tell you that, our staff will tell you that. Hopefully you're becoming more and more familiar with that the more that you're here, that we exist to please God. Everything we do, everything we say, every song that we sing, every word that we proclaim, is that it would please God. That's what it's about. That's what our whole life is about, and so that surely is what the church ought to be about as well. Now, to make that mission even more specific, that's the purpose, the mission of the church, and you've heard this before, is to share the love, joy, and peace of Jesus Christ with the least, the last, and the lost. And let me ask you a question. Whose love, joy, and peace is it? It's Jesus Christ. It's His. It's not ours. We didn't conjure it up. We didn't create it. We didn't innovate it. It's His love, joy, and peace. And many of us in this room would say, I've experienced it. I've encountered it, I've seen it to be true in my life, and now our responsibility is to share what we have experienced with the least, last, and lost. Sometimes we think that love, joy, and peace is only for inside of this building, but that's not true. That's not true. We share love, joy, and peace everywhere that we go, and it's bigger than the building. And so in this new message series called Followership, that's what we're doing, and I know followership probably isn't a word, but I think it should be. I think it should be because we're learning how to follow Jesus and to share his love, joy, and peace with everyone that we encounter, whether they're in this building or outside of this building. We want to make Jesus known. We want him to be famous and not ourselves. Now, when we talk about followership, it's really a leadership principle because the number one principle of leadership is this. If nobody's following you, you're not a leader. You ever met somebody who thinks they're a leader, but there's nobody following, or somebody who thinks they're a leader, but nobody should be following them, right? So if nobody's following, you're not leading. And the second principle of leadership is that to be a great leader, you have to be an even better follower, especially when it comes to the body of Christ. Because we're trying to follow after Christ. We're trying to be like him. And so followership starts with us following Christ. Jesus. And we see this principle in the Bible, in the book of 1 Timothy. First Timothy. We see a relationship between Paul and Timothy. Timothy uh, uh, is a younger man growing up in the church, trying to become a church leader. And Paul is a seasoned apostle, one who has influence and wisdom and is sharing with this younger man. He's trying to encourage him to be more like Christ. In 1 Timothy 1.18, he says, Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. May they help you to fight well in the Lord's battle. And look at this phrase, cling to your faith in Christ. Don't we need to do that now more than ever? Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences, and as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. We see where Paul writes two different letters to Timothy in the Bible, and both of them encourage Timothy not just to lead well, but to learn how to follow well. Not just to follow Paul, but ultimately to learn how to follow Jesus. Now, all of us in this room who are called by the name of Jesus, who are a part of his family, every single one of us are called to be a leader. And you say, oh, no, hold on, not me. I'm not a leader. 
That's for other people, I'm not a leader. No, we're all, as Christians, we are all called to be leaders, and here's how we lead. We either lead people closer to Jesus, or we lead them further from his love, joy, and peace. All of us are. We're called to be leaders and to draw people close to Jesus, and as leaders, we need people in our lives, like a Paul, who inspire Christ-likeness inside of us. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to start in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 11. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 11. And this is our in the vault text for the month of August. I'm going to invite you, if you would, to stand with me if you're able. We're going to stand together and we're going to read it. If you have it in your Bible, I want you to look at it there. This is New Living Translation. If you, if you don't, it's on the screens as most of the verses will be. We emphasize so strongly, if you're new, we emphasize the in the vault text. We emphasize the word of God. I don't preach ideas, I don't preach opinions, because mine are bad. But I preach the word of God because it's always true, it's always faithful, it's living and active, it changes us, and we need it. We need it. We need the word of God in our lives. And so every month, or every week this month, our message is going to start with this verse right here. And we do that because we believe in memorizing scripture and meditating upon the truths of scripture and letting it challenge us and change us and make us more like Jesus. The last Sunday of this month, we're going to set up what we call our quotation stations. You'll have an opportunity to quote this verse if you've memorized it. Last month, the incentive was free tea from HTO. My wife already cashed hers in when she got her free tea. It's just something to encourage you to interact with Scripture on a continual basis in your life. So here's our verse for this month, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. Would you say it with me? 1, 2, 3. But you, Timothy, are a man of God, so run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you for the power of your word. It's life-giving. It's what we need. It feeds our soul. It makes us more like you. It speaks to us. That's the prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Don't let people hear from me. We want to hear from you. You can communicate specifically and uniquely exactly what we need to hear, and we ask you to do that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you're seated. Thank you so much. As Paul is mentoring Timothy, and we see in this verse, he's encouraging Timothy to live like Jesus. He tells him right here in these words to pursue righteousness, to pursue a godly life, to pursue faith and love and perseverance and gentleness, to fight the good fight of faith. And these are great lessons for people who are trying to follow Jesus. And, and the book of Timothy, every week this month, will be our starting point. But the book of James will be our landing point. In fact, if you have your Bible, we're going to go to James chapter 1 and verse 5 in just a second. And you say, well, what's the intersection? What's the connection between Paul, Timothy, and James? Well, just as Paul is mentoring Timothy, James is mentoring all of us in the body of Christ. In fact... It might be possible that even James was a mentor, so to speak, to Paul and Timothy in their days. The reason we think that is possible is because when the book of James was written, it was one of the first New Testament books that were actually written. We know that they're not organized chronologically in our Bibles, but the book of James was written around A.D. 45 to A.D. 49, somewhere in that window. And so believers and Christians who were all over and living in what we call a new reality would have been being mentored or learned or followed the advice of James. These people were good Jews who had been Jews their whole lives until this guy named Jesus showed up. And Jesus changed everything. How many know that's true? When Jesus shows up, everything changes, right? And Jesus showed up and he changed everything. And so now they're trying to discern how do we continue to live in a way that is faithful and true and obedient to the law, but also walk in the freedom that Christ has given us, walk in the newness of life that Jesus provides for us? How do we manage this tension? And so James is mentoring those disciples, he's mentoring us today, and as leaders, we're learning to follow his example and the example of Christ. You know, everybody is following someone. 
And, and really, that's my favorite word for a Christian. We use like the word disciple or the word believer, and those are great, and I love them. But one of my favorite descriptions of us as Christians is followers. We're followers of Jesus. I had a friend when he graduated college, they got to put in the yearbook, uh, what do you want to do with your life? And some people would say, you know, I, I want to be the president. I want to be an astronaut. I want to marry Miss America, you know, things like that. And and my friend in the college yearbook, they said, what are you going to do with your life? And his response was, play follow the leader with Jesus. Except let Jesus be the leader all the time, right? You never take turns on that. Jesus always gets to be the leader. But following, everyone is following someone or something. In my life, I have people that I'm following. Pastor Daryl Wooten, who was pastor of this church for 18 years before my family and I were elected as pastors. I follow his example as my pastor. He's now over our entire state, and he has such influence and authority in my life, and he speaks into me and helps me to be more like Jesus. Pastor Bruce McCarty at Owasso First Assembly is another leader in my life that has influence, and, and I try to follow his example as he follows Jesus. And the reason I'm so comfortable following them because I know who they're following after. They're following after Jesus. And so I'm trying to be like them, but ultimately I'm trying to be like Jesus because if I'm going to lead well, I have to follow well. And so as a great teacher, James begins to mentor us and teach us lessons about Jesus and about the Christian faith in our life. And one of the first lessons he gives us, James chapter 1 and verse number 5, is a lesson about wisdom. That if we're going to be great leaders, if we're going to be great followers who become great leaders... We have to operate in wisdom. And here's what he says. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he'll give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is tossed and blown by the wind. I, I love, and there, there's more to this verse, but I love how it starts with the word, if. If. If you need wisdom, I always laugh when I read that because for me it's not if, it's when. It's when because I'm always needing wisdom. I always need more of God's wisdom in my life. So you, you are so gracious and so wonderful and Robin and I are so honored to serve this body and this community. And Many of you come to me and say, Pastor, how can I pray for you? And I, my default answer most of the time, wisdom. Just pray that God would give me wisdom because I need God's wisdom every day of my life. I need God's wisdom in every circumstance, in every situation. I need God's wisdom to help me be the husband that I'm supposed to be to Robin, to help me to be the parent that I'm supposed to be to Ryan and Kate, to help me to be the pastor that I'm supposed to be to this church. I need God's wisdom. And so it, it kind of makes me laugh if, it's, it's more like when you need wisdom, ask God and look what it says and he'll give it to you. He won't reject you. He won't rebuke you. He'll provide it to you. Proverbs chapter 3 tells us what happens when we gain wisdom. Verse 13 says, joyful is the person who finds wisdom. Joyful is the one who gains understanding. Wisdom is more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. Now before we go any further, I, I've probably said the word wisdom about 25 times already, but we might want to understand or have a functional working knowledge of what we're talking about. What is Wisdom And simply stated, wisdom is the ability or the gift of God to judge correctly. It's the ability or the gift of God to judge correctly. That's what wisdom is. And I've heard other biblical authors or, or those who write about the Bible, theologians and scholars, and they wrote it this way, and it's not on the screen, but I love how they say it. Wisdom is a capacity of the mind that allows us to understand life from God's perspective. Let me say that one more time. Wisdom is a capacity of the mind that allows us to understand life from God's perspective. You know, without God's perspective, a lot of what we face just doesn't make sense sometimes. Without God's perspective, the things that we're doing seem impossible to navigate, impossible to understand, impossible to overcome. But wisdom gives capacity to my mind to help me to see through a lens that I otherwise would not see through, to help me to understand on a level that I otherwise would be unable to process by. And this isn't a trick question, and you don't have to answer out loud if you don't want to, but you get 100 bonus points if you do. When we think about biblical wisdom, what's the first name that comes to mind? Solomon, yeah, you all, everybody that said it gets 100 bonus points, and that's good for absolutely nothing after service. 
But we think about Solomon. Solomon, the Bible tells us, was the most wise man in the world. He asked the Lord for wisdom, and people came to Solomon because he was so good at making decisions. He was so trustworthy in his judgments. 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 29 talks about this process. It says this, God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding. He gave Solomon knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the east and all the wise men of Egypt. This last line, he was wiser than anyone else. He goes on in that passage to say that his fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations and kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. So if we're going to be good followers of Jesus who end up being good leaders for Jesus, we need to be wise. Followership then requires wisdom. It's the first lesson that James is teaching us that if we're going to lead well for Christ, we need the wisdom that Christ provides to us. And I want to give you some thoughts as we think about how wisdom can benefit us as believers. If you have our new app, the Church Center app, the notes are loaded there for you. If not, we're going to put as much as we can on the screen. Gabby and our team does a great job with that, and you can follow along in your notes. But here's the first thought this morning. Wisdom helps us know what is right and what is wrong. Now, when we first read that statement, we go, yeah, we already know what is right and what is wrong. That's easy to come by. You know what? In, in this day and age, it's not as easy as it used to be. We see a lot of times where people are twisting scriptures and they're manipulating the verses of scripture to make it say what they want to say to convince people to believe what they want them to believe and we need the wisdom from heaven to give us the discernment and the understanding to know and to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong we we read and we know that solomon was the wisest man in the whole world but the truth of the matter is it didn't start out that way he was just a son of a king who was made king, and he knew upon becoming king that the task was too big for him, and the people outnumbered him, and it was more than he could handle. So 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 7 is where Solomon's wisdom begins. He's praying, he's talking to the Lord, and he says, Now, Lord my God, you've made me king instead of my father, my father David. But Lord, I'm like a little child who doesn't even know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation that is so great and so numerous that they cannot be counted. And then look at Solomon's words. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference, here it is, between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? It's such amazing humility that we see from Solomon right here. Upon becoming king, the first thing that he prays for is wisdom. And God grants his prayer and grants that desire. And we, we go on to read in this passage of scripture where one of the first great situations that Solomon is faced with is two mothers that both have babies about three days apart. And they come into his presence because there's a dispute. And mom number one says, in the middle of the night, mom number two rolled over on her baby and her baby died. So mom two took her baby and came to me and took my living baby and exchanged it for her dead baby. And then when we woke up in the morning, she had my baby and I had her baby. And mom number two said, no, 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 no. She's got that totally wrong. It was, it was her that did that. She's putting it off on me, but she's the one who did that and blamed it for me. The, the living baby is mine. And mom one says, no, the living baby is mine. And mom two says, no, the living baby is mine. It's a great conundrum, a great decision that Solomon has to make there. And he says something that I will probably never, ever say. Bring me a sword. I mean, maybe when I'm going to eat a steak. But other than that, I'm never going to say, bring me a sword. But Solomon says, bring me a sword. We're going to divide the baby in half, and you'll each get a half of the baby that remains. The mom who was the true mom immediately squeals, no, let her have the baby. Solomon said, there it is. This is the true mom, because she would never let something like that happen to her baby. And the people were astonished and amazed at the wisdom that Solomon displayed in that moment. Because wisdom helps us to know the right thing to do versus the wrong thing to do. But even Solomon, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 7, look at these words. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Know right from wrong. Then you'll have healing for your body 
and strength for your bones. So wisdom helps us to know what is right and what is wrong. The second thing that wisdom helps us do, and, and there's many, probably more that we could cover in any, even an entire month. Wisdom helps us know what to speak and when to say silent. You know, recently I was w- with a family and I was texting Robin as I was on my way to be with this family. And I said, my prayer has been, Lord, give me the words to speak and the wisdom when not to speak. Because how many know sometimes we can unwisely say the wrong thing and not mean it? And sometimes it's more just the fact that we showed up and didn't say anything than it is that we showed up and had the right words to say. And if God's truly God and his wisdom is available to us and his Holy Spirit guides us, then he can provide us the wisdom to know when to say something and what to say, but also the wisdom to know when to be quiet. And so I prayed that prayer, and that's what wisdom does. It helps us to know when to speak and when to stay silent. And I never realized, but we see this point so profoundly in the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And when we look at at Luke chapter 1, we see that an angel comes to a young woman, perhaps even a teenage girl, and the angel begins to speak to her. Luke chapter 134, you will conceive and you'll give birth to a son. You'll name him Jesus. He will be very great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary responds with a very, very wise question how can this happen i'm a virgin right i mean i wouldn't have thought to ask that i'm not a woman i'll never be pregnant so questions like that will never come into my mind but a wise question of i i I, i'm tracking with you most of the way but i'm not married I'm a virgin, so I believe, but give me a little more clarity or context to this. The Holy Spirit, the angel speaks to her again and says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born to you will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. And Mary responds by saying, I trust. Look at what she says in verse 38 of Luke chapter one. I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Now, we obviously know there are only two genders, right? How many of you in the room are a woman, and how many of you in the room have ever been pregnant? Just, if you're not ashamed. Yeah, some of you are like, you're not Okay. All you ladies out here know she had more questions than that. (laughs) Right? Like, for the guys, that's good enough. Oh, you're going to have a baby? Cool. But for the ladies, it's like, when is this going to happen? Because I need to prepare right like we got to get the nursery ready we got to paint the room we got to buy the clothes we got to have a baby shower question two how am I supposed to explain this to my fiance how am I supposed to tell my family what's happened question three and this is one that I've never thought about because I've never been pregnant nor will I is the baby going to look like me like if I'm going to do the work The Holy Spirit's going to impregnate me, and I'm going to carry this baby for nine months, and I'm going to go through childbirth and labor. Am I at least going to get something out of the deal? Is he going to look like me a little bit? What color hair and all? Like, she had some questions, right? Ladies will back me up on this. She had questions, but what did she say? Wisdom. May it be as you said, I'm the Lord's servant. Why? Because wisdom helps us to know what to speak and when to stay silent. And in that moment, the wisdom from heaven fell upon Mary and she said I choose to trust I choose to trust I don't have to have all the answers I choose to trust that's what wisdom helps us to do to know when to speak and when to stay silent the third thing that wisdom does it helps us know where to go and when to stay patient because there are times when we feel this urge in our body or in our spirit that something happens to us and we have to go we have to go we have to go right now we have to move and there are other times when we feel comfortable in staying where we are and being patient and trusting God. And maybe the latter is harder than the first, right? Sometimes it's easy to fly off the handle and go. You know, how many of you have the signs in your yard that says, uh, we don't call 911, we shoot first and ask forgiveness later, right? You know who you are. And that's kind of our mentality. We're Oklahomans, right? That's what we do. But wisdom says, I, I trust God's timing and leading for where I'm supposed to go or for when I'm supposed to stay patient. 
We know that Solomon prayed for wisdom. We read that a minute ago, but look at God's response in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 10 when Solomon prayed for an understanding heart. It says, The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom, and God replied, Because you asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, because you've not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and an understanding heart such as no one has ever had or ever will have. What, what, a, what a granting of a request. I'll give you such a wise and understanding heart. But then God says, I'll do even more than that. This isn't part of the message, but aren't you thankful that God does even more than we could ask for? Come on, aren't you thankful that he does even more? He gives us, but he gives us even more. He's a God of more than enough. He says, I'm not just going to give you an understanding heart. I'm going to give you something that you did not ask for. In other words, something you wouldn't have even known to ask for, wouldn't have thought to ask for. I'm going to give you riches and fame as well. When we think about where to go and when to stay patient, we know that life presents us with challenging decisions. And sometimes it is knowing between right and knowing what is wrong. But other times, it's determining or deciding between what is good and what is best. And that could be a more difficult decision, couldn't it? Because right and wrong sometimes are more black and white. I know the lines get clouded in this day and age, but, but good and best is confusing. Robin has a saying. She says, good is bad when it's not God's best. Good is bad when it's not God's best. And sometimes we get comfortable and we get convenient where we are in the relationships and the status of where we are in, in the process of our life that we get very comfortable with good and God says I want you to have best but you're settling for good and we think it's good but really it becomes bad because it keeps us from getting to God's best when you study throughout the entire Old Testament and we don't have time to go through it all today but you'll see times where the nation of Israel was under attack or they had enemies that were against them and there are moments when God says go move now Here's how you're supposed to go. Here's how you're going to overcome your enemy. Here's how you're going to get the victory. But you see other times, like Exodus chapter 14, where God says, you need only be still. The Lord your God will fight for you. And wisdom says, I could go, I want to go, but I trust God and I'm choosing to stand still. I'm choosing to believe that God is fighting for me and I know that he has spoken to me, so I'm wisely going to stand still in this circumstance because in the next circumstance, he might tell us, to go and to fight. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 12, it'll be on the screen for you. It says this, Wisdom will save you from evil people, from those whose words are twisted. God gives us wisdom to know when we're supposed to go somewhere or when we're supposed to stay patient. He gives us wisdom to know the people that we're supposed to hang around with and the times that we're supposed to hang back from those relationships. Wisdom from heaven helps us to be good followers so that we can be good leaders. Another thing that wisdom does for us is it helps us to know how to respond and when to stand still. This is similar to the last point that we talked about, but it's a little bit different because sometimes we don't know how to respond. And something that I used to teach as a youth pastor that I've followed and used all throughout my life is this simple phrase, I cannot control what happens to me, but I can control my response to what happens to me. And oftentimes that's the only thing that I can control is my response. I, I can't control what is done or what occurs or what, what pops up in my life, but I have complete control over how I respond to those things that do happen in my life. There's a great story in the Old Testament. If you have your Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 25, it's the story of David and his encounter with a man named Nabal and his wife Abigail. Now, David, as we know, was on the run from Saul. It seems like that's the story of his life over and over again, that David has been anointed to be king. Saul doesn't want him to be king, so Saul is chasing him to try to kill him. And there's this couple, his man, the man's name was Nabal, his wife was Abigail. She was sensible and beautiful, but Nabal was crude and mean. It sounds like a perfect pair, doesn't it? Sensible and beautiful with crude and mean. Beauty and the beast right there. 
in the past, uh, David's men had helped Nabal's men. And now that he's on the run, David reaches out to Nabal for help. He thinks, hey, I've scratched your back in the past and helped your guys. Now when I'm desperate in my moment of need, my life is in danger. Will you return the favor and scratch my back? Will you help us out? We need provisions. We need supplies. We need your help because Saul's chasing after us. The bonus part of this story is that it was what's called shearing sheep shearing season don't say that fast because you can't sheep shearing season is what it was all that means is that it would have been a time of celebration it was almost like a harvest time people were in a good mood they had festivals they would share they would provide they would rejoice over the good things that had come and, and had happened in their lives and so David sends his men to Nabal and says we're in trouble and we need your help can you provide us with resources in our moment of need and Nabal responds with these words who is David? In our day and age, he would have said, who this? Who does David think he is? Why should I help him, Nabal says. Now David's he's not just angry, he's offended. He's offended. In the past, I've been there for your guys. We have helped your men, and now in this time of need, you won't help us. He's not just angry and offended, he's insulted. And he tells his men, strap on your swords. We're going to get provisions from this dude one way or the other. He's either going to provide them to us, or we're going to go take them by force. So strap on your swords. We're going to get what we need from this guy. One of Nabal's men hears about this, and he reports back to Abigail, the sensible, beautiful woman that she was. He says, hey, listen, David's been good to us. He's asked your husband for help. Your husband's not going to help him, and I think we're all going to be in trouble, because if David and his men get here, who knows what's going to happen to us? Abigail immediately springs into action. Wisely, she loads a caravan full of provisions, and she starts on her way to where David is. And the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 25, in verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey, she bowed low before him, and she fell at his feet and said these words, I accept all the blame in this matter, my Lord. Please listen to what I have to say. I know that Nabal is a wicked and ill-tempered man. Please don't pay any attention to him. He's a fool, just as his name suggests. But I never even saw the young men you sent. So here's a present that I, your servant, have brought to you and to your young men. You see, God gave Abigail the wisdom to know how to respond in this moment and in this challenge. Had Abigail sat still and not done anything, we don't, we don't want to imagine what it could have happened. In fact, here's what we do know. The Bible goes on to tell us that while Abigail is out making amends and literally saving her family from destruction, Nabal is back home throwing a feast, enjoying all the provisions that he has. And one of the men runs back to Nabal and, and the message gets delivered through Abigail and through the man and says, hey, uh, we found out about what was going on with David and we took him plenty of provisions and supplied him and, and you didn't do anything, but don't worry, everything's going to be good. He was so stunned by this news and, you know, had to be somehow divinely orchestrated. He had like a stroke or a heart attack and he died in that instant. God took him out. The, the bonus part of the story that we miss is David then looks at Abigail and goes, hey. I don't want you to be alone at the funeral. You're beautiful and sensible. And I got a caravan full of guys and provisions from your deceased husband and he takes her as his wife and again God gives us more than what we could ask for but it started with God giving Abigail the wisdom to know when and how to respond to this crisis and, and I don't know about you but I speak for myself so many times there are crisis or challenge or difficult moments and it's like I just need somebody to tell me what to do right James chapter 1 says if you need wisdom ask our generous God and he'll give it to you. That's kind of how we want to finish up this morning is we want to think about this last concept that wisdom is not hard to obtain. Sometimes even maybe when I started talking about wisdom, you probably said, oh, that's for later down the life. That, that's for, I have, to, I have to read a lot. I have to have a lot of degrees on the wall. I have to have a lot of life experience. I have to have more gray hair and then I can get wisdom. You know, and, and, and that's gonna come sometime later in my life. It's, it's not for me. It's not for, for now. But James chapter one, verse five completely counters that line of thinking. It says, if you lack or need wisdom, ask God. Ask God. He's generous 
He'll give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. And you know, most of us, when we think about asking for something, our number one fear is rejection. We don't want to ask for something and get turned down. We don't want to ask for something and be like called out for asking it. But James says so clearly, God won't rebuke you. He won't reject you. He's generous. And if you need wisdom, he's going to provide it to you. He's going to give you what you need. When you study the word wisdom in the Hebrew language, it's the word chokma, C-H-O-K-M-A-H, chokma. And it's the ability to judge correctly and to follow the best course of action. In other words, it's practical wisdom. It's knowing what to do and when to do it, right? That's what we need is we need to know what to do and we need to know when to do it. And that's, and that's wisdom. And that wisdom comes from experiences that we have and from the company that we keep. And so if we want to obtain wisdom, the first question we ask ourselves is, what company are we keeping? Well, we can ask God, and the Bible says he'll provide us with the wisdom that we need. But secondly, if we want wisdom, we have to surround ourselves with wise people. We have to surround ourselves with people who are wise. It's not on the screen, but Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. I've shared this with you before, but, but we've got to look at this again because the Bible, it's always speaking to us, right? Right? Okay, I didn't get a single right there. It says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get into trouble. Who are you walking with? Who are you following? Who's walking with you on the journey of life? You are called to be a leader whether you believe it or not. You are called to be a leader, but to be a leader, you have to be a good follower. Who are you following? Who are you walking with? Are you walking with God because he's wise? Are you walking with other wise people because it's gonna make you wise? It's gonna give you the wisdom from heaven. But do you know the, the, the wisest thing that you could ever do is say yes to Jesus. It's the wisest thing you could ever do is welcome his presence, his peace, his power into your life. So this morning, I want to just give you a second. We didn't do this last week. We let everybody's heads uh, stay up. But I want to ask you this morning if you'd bow your heads for just a second. I know that can go both ways, but today we're going to bow our heads for a second. Have you ever accepted Christ? Have you ever received him as Savior and Lord? If you haven't, this morning is, is for you. If you have, you're probably praying right now for those who haven't. You're probably praying that their heart would be open and receptive. Have you said yes to Jesus, but maybe you've not been wise in the way you followed him. Maybe you've made some bad choices and some bad decisions, and you're not right with God, if you're being honest. You're not in right standing with him. You're not living the life that you're supposed to live. The most wise thing you could do in this moment is to say yes to Jesus. We change, but he stays the same. He's faithful. He's faithful. He does not change. And so in just a moment, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I'm just going to ask you to simply lift your hands so that we can pray for you. But I'm going to give you that opportunity to say yes to Jesus, to receive his forgiveness and salvation, to receive that fresh start where the Bible says if we're in Christ, we're a new creation. The old things are gone and all things are made new. So if that's you this morning, again, I won't embarrass you, and you'd like to say yes to Jesus, whether today's the first time, or maybe you're just making some things right, would you just simply lift your hand and make eye contact with me so that I know to pray for you in just a moment? Would you raise your hand? Thank you. I've seen a couple hands that have gone up. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those who have raised those hands this morning. Many of you have done that and made that decision. If you're watching online this morning, you could just put the word yes in your chat box, you can let us know that you're making that decision as well. It is, the, it is the wisest decision that you could ever make is to say yes to Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So when you lifted your hand this morning, what you indicated was that you believe. But the Bible says there's that moment of confession as well where we have to speak out our faith. And so we pray a prayer together. It's the first of many prayers. It's the first of many uh, times of confession that we're going to have because we have to be vocal and public about our faith. So I'm going to ask everybody, if you're watching online, if you're here, whether you raised your hand or not, pray this prayer with me now. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I'm sorry that I've sinned and lived a life that was not pleasing to you. Today I receive you as my Savior and Lord. 
I ask you to forgive me of my sins and make me more like you. And I will do my best to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God is so good and he's so faithful. I want to close today by taking an opportunity for us to receive God's wisdom. And by the way, if you said yes to Jesus, you can text that number, 918-766-9117. I'll be in the Welcome Center in just a moment. I'd love to talk to you, pray with you, give you some resources. We'd love to talk to you about baptism and get you baptized in water following Jesus' example. But as we close this morning, would you be so kind if you're able, would you please stand with me across this worship center today? What a great crowd. Thank you for being here on this Labor Day weekend love you so much I know that probably if I asked who needs wisdom we would all say I need wisdom I need wisdom every day every moment twice a day three times a day and four times on Monday because that's what Monday's like but I also know that there may be some of you in this room that you need specific wisdom what I mean by that is maybe you've got a medical situation and you just need to know what to do Maybe you've got a financial circumstance that you're working through and you need God's wisdom to help you through that. Maybe there's a relationship and you're trying to mend some things and you need to know what to speak and when not to speak. Maybe you have a prodigal loved one in your life and you need to know how hard to press and when to step back and just live a life before them. Maybe you're a business owner or maybe you have authority in your company and you just need the wisdom of heaven, the wisdom of God to help you to be astute and upright in your decision making. We're going to take just a second as Robin plays, maybe just 60 seconds, and we're just going to do exactly what the Bible says. We are going to ask our generous God to give us wisdom, and we know that he's not going to rebuke us for doing that. So whatever way is most comfortable for me, I'm going to lift my hands and I'm just going to pray that God would give me wisdom. You do that in whatever way works for you. But here's what I'm believing is that God is going to begin to download the wisdom from heaven upon you. Lord Jesus, we seek your wisdom. The Bible says we could ask and you'd provide it to us. Lord, for those who don't know what to do, need direction. For those who own a business and have big choices. For those who are struggling with a diagnosis and have to make difficult choices. For those who are trusting you for a prodigal son or daughter in their salvation. And they don't know how much to press and how much to back off and trust. For those who need restoration of their emotions or of a relationship. And they're not sure when they should speak versus when they should be silent. Maybe there's a student in here who's trying to decide about their future. Maybe it's college, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a career direction. And they're trying to navigate those waters. They need to know when to go and when to be patient. We ask for your wisdom. The Bible says you would not rebuke us for asking, that you would give it generously to us. So we thank you that we're receiving it. As we close our time together, would you just begin to thank him for the wisdom that he's given you? Come on, speak it in faith. Thank you. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you that you're giving me wisdom. It's not my wisdom. It's not my uh, intellect. It's, it's wisdom from heaven that you're pouring into me. Just thank him for it. Believe it. Receive it from him by faith. The wisdom from heaven. Thank you, Jesus. What a great Sunday it's been, man. God's truly been in this place today. Before we go, I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. So if you're comfortable, raise your hands uh, towards heaven. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We love you guys. Have a wonderful week.